Welcome to this quick overview of a particular pathway through a course on the philosophy of social science. In order to think about issues in the philosophy of social science, it's important to begin by thinking about what is the nature of the social world and how is the social world different from the natural world. Of course, the social world is part of the natural world, but it is also different in the sense that it is constituted by the actions, thoughts, and interactions of individuals, of socially situated actors. And we can take it as um, a premise. In fact, this premise is called ontological individualism. We can take it as a premise that all social entities are composed of or are constituted by assemblages of some sort of individual actors with mental frameworks and modes of action. And then we can understand higher level social entities as being built up out of the interactions and actions and thoughts and mental frameworks and so forth of the actors who constitute them. And this includes institutions, organizations, ideologies, normative frameworks, cultures, fields, and large social structures. And all of these social constructions involve micro foundations. So we need to have a conception, at least a framework of social ontology and another um, the slideshow kind of goes through the social ontology, which I have put forward in a little bit more detail. But the highlights are these. Um, we need a social ontology. Uh, the one which I would advocate is one that I would refer to, or we in the discipline refer to, as ontological individualism. It involves the idea that uh, um, social entities, social structures, social um, processes and forces depend on the actors who constitute them. And we might describe that situation as saying that they depend on micro foundations. I have um, advocated for the idea of methodological localism as distinct from methodological individualism. And in a, in a nutshell, this is the idea that all social facts derive from interactions among socially constituted, socially situated actors. And this is in contrast both to methodological individualism, but also methodological holism. So this is an actor-centered approach to the social sciences. And that means that we need to have a theory of the actor, a theory of how and why and under what sorts of conditions and circumstances individuals act as they do. There are multiple theories we could put forward. The most common theory is a theory of purposive intentionality or purposive rationality. It's a theory which is both commonsensical, but also has philosophical antecedents in Aristotle. But as we'll see in just a minute, there are other ways of thinking about um, action and actors. Um, we could kind of recognize that uh, many of our actions are not exactly deliberative, not exactly intentional and purposive, rather they are habitual or possibly they are creative. And this idea is associated with pragmatism or what is now called the new pragmatism. But we also need to take into account in some way the ways in which norms and the normative frameworks which uh, actors have absorbed and the cultural frameworks in which they operate, how these normative and cultural cues influence their actions. We can talk also about the scripts and performances which individuals perform. And this is um, an idea which is pursued by Irving Goffman. It is also tempting to talk about group actors or collective actors, but here we have to use a lot of caution. Uh, the, the point about ontological individualism continues to be, I believe, a valid point about ontology. And that means, therefore, that groups must be understood as consisting of actors, individual actors. And so if we want to um, have a conception of group intentionality, we need to be able to relate that to the intentionality, the mental frameworks, the actions of the individuals who make up the group. We can say that groups gain a semblance of collective intentionality through the fact that individual actors have group-oriented intentions and interactions with each other. 
We can also understand that organizations sometimes have something analogous to group intentionality um, as described by philosophers such as uh, List and Pettit. And um, so it's, it's worth digging into the idea of collective, um, collective action and collective actors, but we, it is important to keep in mind the idea that um, there, there's nothing mysterious about a collective actor or a group. Rather, it depends on the individual actors of which it is composed. The new pragmatism I've just mentioned, but it is um, the idea that um, we can conceive of actors more broadly than the Aristotelian view would suggest, um, more broadly than the rational intentional view, which is offered by rational choice theory and desire belief opportunity theory and Aristotelian theory. We can recognize that actions are often generated by habits, scripts, rules of thumb, Actions often involve creativity and, and improvisation. Actions are embedded in a flow of related actors and actions. Andrew Abbott writes, I am arguing the stronger point that the acting self is continuously remade in interaction and that the environment of possible endowments and contrasts, the environment of others and past experience provides the ground whence comes this remaking. This complex of views about a more complex and a um, more uh, multi-dimensional theory of the actor is associated with the new pragmatism. An idea which emerges from consideration of social ontology is the idea that the social world differs from the natural world in another way. We think of the natural world as being strictly law governed, or at least the pre-quantum mechanics, uh, pre 20th century physics natural world, um, the social world is not law governed. Um, it, instead, it is heterogeneous. The entities of the social world are plastic, they change over time, and there is a high degree of contingency in the social world. There are no uniform social kinds in the social world. Rather, every social category, uh, the idea of a state or a religious group or an ideological formation, all of these um, nouns uh, encompass phenomena which show the, these very same features of heterogeneity, plasticity, and contingency over uh, place and time. And we can, we can draw this out through reference to things as diverse as racial identities, religious identities, the idea of a city, the idea of a market economy, the idea of a university. In every instance, we have contingency, plasticity, and heterogeneity at work. Why would the social world have these characteristics? Well, because the social world is not determined by some underlying order. Rather, it is simply the consequence of the actions of a myriad of individuals, maybe two individuals playing a game of uh, something or other, or maybe 10 million individuals or 100 million individuals participating in an election. And so outcomes are dependent on the actions of the individuals who make them up. So there isn't any more fundamental order than the order which is created by individual actors making choices, acting, uh, acting on the basis of scripts, possibly acting on the basis of habit. But the social outcomes are simply the result of those individual level actions. We can infer from that that there is no directionality in the social world. Social change doesn't automatically seek equilibrium. Uh, there sometimes are uh, feedback loops among social phenomena, but just as often there's a kind of a random walk of social phenomena. Uh, I would put it forward that there are no social essences, no essential features of capitalism, Islam, modernization, the liberal state. Rather, um, institutions and normative systems and ideologies, all of these social entities have prominent aspects of contingency and what we might say was a random walk. Well, what about institutions and organizations? Uh, if, if we are interested in social entities, these are sort of the entities which are um, closest to the individual. So what is an institution? What is an organization? 
We can think of an institution as being a system of roles, rules, and opportunities. Um, it is um, in motion. Individuals are located within institutions, and it's a complicated um, back and forth. Uh, 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 Coleman refers to it as kind of a house of cards conception of causation because the individuals within an institution are both constrained and guided by the institution, but their behavior also entrenches and establishes the workings of the institution. A person whose work um, I feature in, in my courses on philosophy of social science is Kathleen Thalen, who asks in her writings about institutions and institutional change, she asks the excellent question, what are the social mechanisms that provide a degree of rigidity to institutional arrangements. And uh, one prominent part of her answer is, it's the interests of the power holders. So what about organizations? Is an organization the same thing as an institution? No, it, I would uh, put it that an organization is um, a, um, uh, it, it's an ensemble of a group of individuals who are coordinated through um, a specific set of rules and uh, relationships among these individuals. There are mechanisms of direction and control, of supervision, of coordination and competition. There are processes of communication and control. Uh, the idea uh, put forward by Fligstein and McAdam of strategic action fields is a very rich way of trying to understand how an organization works. Um, and organizations are designed and are maintained by individuals who want to accomplish something specific through the organization. The um, uh, General Motors Corporation manufactures cars and extends credit for the purpose of um, generating profits. So its actions are intentional, but of course, intentional means that it has officers and directors and supervisors and frontline workers and engineers, all coordinated through organizational means. So we can think of organizations as having functions which have been designed into them, but we can also think of organizations as embodying unintentional dysfunctions. For example, principal agent problems, um, problems where the supervisor or director has one set of intentions, but the agents whom he or she supervises uh, is pursuing a, pursuing a different set of priorities. There may be conflicting internal priorities, there may be uh, communications failures, and the net result is that organizations are not fully functional. A common approach now in the philosophy of social science is an approach to explanation. What is a good explanation? What is a good social explanation? And the, um, the answer, which has the most promise, uh, in my opinion, is the idea of uh, putting forward a theory of the causal mechanisms which underlie the outcome that we're interested in. What are the causal mechanisms that lead to, let's say, the rise of fascism or the collapse of a particular republic or the outbreak of war? we would like to be able to discover the causal mechanisms which led to those outcomes. So what is a causal mechanism? Uh, here is one definition. A causal mechanism is a particular configuration of conditions and processes that always or normally lead from one set of conditions to an outcome through the properties and powers of the events and entities in the domain of concern. A causal explanation therefore requires discovery of the mechanisms that brought it about. Whenever we're talking about causation, we, we are thinking of the idea of necessity. And in order to say that um, there's a, a necessary connection between a cause and its effect, we need to have a theory of the substrate of causation, the, the reality within which causal powers, causal mechanisms operate. And in the social world, what is that substrate? It is the, um, the actions and situated uh, decision-making of social actors. It's common in talking about and, and trying to analyze the idea of a causal mechanism in this literature to refer also to causal powers. 
this has been especially important in the literature of critical realism. What is a causal power? It is thought to be a generative push that is in some way inherent in the entity in question, a push which brings about a certain kind of outcome. It is an Aristotelian idea. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the best way of understanding causal powers and causal mechanisms is uh, that uh, these are uh, complementary ideas. Uh, we can offer the idea that um, X brings about Y, that this is a causal mechanism, but then in order to account for the fact that X brings about Y, we want to know what are the powers which X embodies in virtue of which it brings about Y. So we can kind of um, drop down from the idea that X to Y is a mechanism uh, into an analysis of what are the underlying causal powers. It has sometimes been appealing in the philosophy of social science to postulate that social structures, social arrangements are arranged in such a way as to serve the needs of the social system as a whole. This is uh, called functionalism or there's the idea that um, there are reasons to expect functional adaptation of social arrangements for the, the, the good of the social system in some way. And this is an analogy with um, evolution, with biological ev evolution. But um, this is an idea that we have to be very, very careful about. Um, if we just take it literally, um, I believe it represents a serious fallacy because there is no mechanism genuinely comparable to variation and natural selection, which would justify the inference to social functionality. If we wanted to believe that organizations or firms or modes of production or any kind of social arrangement uh, becomes functionally adapted to the needs of the population that it, um, within which it exists, we would have to be able to provide a mechanism of adaptation and selection, but I believe that there is no such mechanism aside from design, which we could specify. What about cultures and norms? We've talked a little bit about structures, about organizations, about institutions. How about cultures and norms? How do cultures and norms fit into this actor-centered theory of the social world? And I think the answer is kind of straightforward, that uh, cultural systems, normative systems, they too are embodied in um, the uh, perceptions and motivations and mental frameworks of specific individuals. So we can be realist about cultures and norms that actors come to embody mental or cognitive or affective frameworks through which they analyze the world and pursue their goals. Cultures are real, but we also must be able to provide um, micro foundations for claims about cultures and norms. We can't simply postulate the culture influences the individuals in a particular time and place. Instead, we need to be able to say, what are the concrete social mechanisms, institutional arrangements through which culture is transmitted to specific individuals? And how is it embodied in other specific individuals? Ethnomethodology is an important contribution to a social, um, to a, uh, an actor-centered approach to sociology. And here I'm thinking of people like um, uh, Goffman and Garfinkel, who undertook to provide thick analysis of social actors, not to work with a schematic theory of the actor, or what you might call a thin theory of the actor, but instead to try to dig down and see if it's possible through empirical investigation to discover what are some of the specific um, um, patterns or processes through which individual actors uh, behave as they do. Goffman used ethnographic methods to study the mental and cognitive frameworks of individual actors in a variety of roles, waiters, supervisors, psychiatrists, and patients. And he emphasized the ideas of scripts and frames through which individual actors processed situations in the world and acted. Garfinkel uh, studied formalized modes of action, things like judges and lawyers and accountants, in order to uncover the rules or grammars according to which they acted. And in both cases, there is the idea that individuals in these specific social settings 
have um, uh, fairly specific codes or grammars according to which they act in those settings. Finally, I'd like to highlight comparative historical sociology, which you might say is just one perhaps small part of sociology. But a different way of thinking about it is that comparative historical sociology is especially well suited to an actor-centered approach to the social world and an approach which emphasizes contingency, heterogeneity, and plasticity. Comparative historical sociology attempts to explain social processes through careful study of historical cases and episodes. Researchers such as George Steinmetz emphasize the context dependence and conjunctural contingency of historical events. Comparative historical researchers are receptive to the idea of uncovering concrete social mechanisms within specific historical processes. An outstanding example of this kind of analysis can be found in McAdam, Tarot, and Tilly in their um, joint book, Dynamics of Contention, 2001, in which they analyze rebellions, uprisings, and civil wars in terms of an open-ended number of mid-level social mechanisms that can be discerned in case studies of episodes. So that's a lightning tour of one way of thinking about the philosophy of social science. There are many other paths that one could take through the philosophy of social science. And I haven't talked about uh, a number of issues which some philosophers have taken to be um, right at the center of the topic, like reductionism or supervenience or emergence. Haven't talked about those ideas at all. And I do agree that those are important parts of the philosophy of social science. I think we can relate those ideas to many of the ideas which have been discussed in this lightning tour. Thanks for listening.